uh, type of consortium that uh, Mark uh, McClure will present on. I'll introduce Mark a little bit uh, later. My name is uh, Matthias uh, Carlson. Uh, I'm with Whitson as a GM Americas here in uh, Houston. Uh, and before we're going to start the webinar today, we just wanted to go through a few logistical uh, items. Uh, the first thing is that the me uh, meeting has more than, actually I saw before the, the call, almost close to 300 registered participants, which is really good. Uh, all of them are muted by default, uh, so we're using uh, Teams, but that does not mean that you're not able to ask questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, use the Q&A chat box or just a regular chat, and I'll try to facilitate those questions after Mark's uh, presentation. Uh, that you can find there down to the right. You might have to click either the chat or the Q&A box at the top of the screen so you see that little mark right uh, right there. Um, Mark's presentation will be 45 uh, to 60 minutes with uh, including the Q&A part. Uh, we are recording it, so the recording will be distributed after uh, the fact. Uh, and the webinar, as I mentioned, facilitated by uh, Woodson, who develops and uh, commercially provides uh, Whitson Plus, which is just a uh, all-in-one solution for DCA, PBT, bottle pressures, RTA, and full physics numerical modeling. And we've also added in uh, a lot of things related to well test lately, and we're very excited about getting uh, Mark's uh, DFIT uh, workflow into the software here later in September. Uh, online at wits.com slash training, you can see the yearly software courses that we uh, have every single year. Uh, there's also other webinars uh, like uh, this that you can access there on wits.com slash training. Um, so uh, similar to this one, we'll have several uh, other webinars next month and uh, throughout the end of, uh, of the year, and they're 100% uh, free and all of them are uh, recorded. Last thing, for those that are in Canada and would like to join uh, something called WIT Canada, that is a, uh, a uh, uh, basically user meeting for WITS and POS users in Canada. Uh, so you can join there in person, or you can also get a virtual link if you'd like to attend uh, that. If you're interested in that, reach out to my colleague Graham Helfrich. His email is given here at the bottom of the screen. And Graham, please just send uh, some of your contact info in, uh, in, uh, in the chat there if you're interested in, in uh, and joining with Canada. So with that, I'm excited about introducing the speaker. Um, the speaker today is uh, Dr. Mark uh, McClure. Uh, Mark has uh, uh, founded and is the, also the CEO of, uh, of Restfrac. It's a company that a lot of us uh, uh, know, especially us in uh, this uh, space. Uh, they're providing a, a uh, call it a combined fracturing and reservoir simulator uh, to the market and it's been uh, at least uh, seems like it's working with all the clients we're working with as well so it seems like you've done an amazing job with that uh, mark so congrats uh, with uh, with that uh, mark also has a really strong technical background has both his master and and phd from stanford university uh, he's done a lot of teaching not only through his uh, role at uh, restfrac but also uh, through his uh, uh, positions as assistant uh, professor at UT Austin and also adjunct uh, professor at Stanford uh, University. Uh, last thing to mention is that Mark is uh, is a very good guy, uh, so uh, very approachable if you meet him in person. Super technical, um, and uh, he's a guy that lets the facts uh, talk and uh, and uh, uh, not speculation. And that's something we we really appreciate, uh, Mark. As uh, so with that, we're excited to to welcome you to uh, to uh, the webinar and. Uh, I'll leave the floor to uh, to you. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Matthias, for uh, inviting me to speak. Let me go ahead and share my screen. You know, I think we uh, we over here are big fans of uh, of Whitson. It's true. We do have a, a lot of of common clients, and um, you know, I think there's kind of a, a brotherhood among these uh, kind of um, I don't know if Whitson's young, but relatively fast uh, growing and kind of innovative uh, oil and gas tech company. So. Happy to be here and, and thanks again. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking today about a, a titled Comparative Analysis of 62 DFITs from Nine Different Shale Plays. That's the name of an SPE paper that I presented last year. I think more generally, I'm going to talk about the work that I and others have done on DFIT interpretation and trying to extend what we can do with DFIT interpretation and also improve reliability. Uh, as as Matthias mentioned, my company Resfrac, we make this combined hydraulic fracture reservoir simulator. Here, I'll just pull up the website here, um, and this is very closely tied to DFIT because 
really what I'm going to present today, what it arises from is the application of an older code that I used to, to use at Stanford and, and at UT called CFRAC, but it's, it's taking a simulator that can simulate crack propagation, fluid flow in a fully three-dimensional sense, um, fracture closure, you know, when you put all the physics together, what does that tell you about DFIT? And so this presentation is what we've learned about DFIT over the years, having started with, with, with a full physics tool and then kind of going uh, from there. Uh, also, Matthias was suggesting I, I mention our, uh, our Res app that we have coming out, so I'll give it a quick plug. Um, Igor Dantsov, our chief scientist, has been spending some time over the last uh, probably 18 months or so developing a correlation for propent transport from the well. So issues like propent turning the corner, settling out to the bottom, having a hard time getting up to, to perf shots at the top of the well. And so we've developed a little web app that allows you to calculate, um, you know, basically for a given perf design, perf phasing, perf spacing, it'll help you um, It'll help you, um, let's see. Yeah, it'll help you predict where the profit's gonna go. So here's our little web app telling us where, how much profit's gonna flow out of each shot on a per cluster basis, per shot basis, slurry, erosion, all this stuff. So this is actually an app, here's uncertainty quantification. So this is an app we're actually gonna be releasing at the end of the month. Um, we've made this new term res apps because we've realized we're gonna start making some, um, some web apps to do things. And this will be the first one, so. Anyhow, that's a quick plug for that. Thanks for letting me do that, Matthias. Um, all right, let me jump in now on the talk. So let's use that. And yeah, let me start with this slide. So I'm really going to talk about what I call the ERTEC 2019-123 compliance method procedure. Um, it started in 2013 to 2014 time period. I was at UT Austin. I had a group of about a dozen grad students working for me. And we had a couple projects we did with Professor Sharma in his consortium that they were supporting. And one of them was on DFIT. And I started me and Ho Jung, who is the grad student, we were running simulations of DFITs and we were trying to start with, hey, can we match the right answer? So we would simulate a DFIT, we would interpret it using a procedure that we were seeing in the literature, and we would say, hey, did the simulation give the right answers? And we consistently found that it didn't. Uh, and so for you know some period of time, we thought, well, maybe there's something wrong with our numerical model and you know, we're not getting the right answer here. But after a while, we you know checked everything and we kind of did some math and we realized, no, we're getting the right answer. It looks like the method is giving the wrong answer. And so um, that is the method that we call the, the tangent method. Uh, and the tangent method for interpreting fracture closure was systematically inaccurate. That's what our simulations were showing. So let me just show a couple of pictures to illustrate this concept. Uh, this is a real DFIT from the Utica. It was contributed by one of the companies in the DFIT industry study that I led in 2018. And uh, on the x-axis here, we have what's called g time. So that is a function of time. It's a little bit like the square root of shut-in time. And so just for background, in case anyone is not familiar, in a DFIT, you're trying to measure the stress, permeability, and pore pressure. Usually performed, for example, the most common scenario is uh, it's a horizontal well in shale. The well has been drilled and cemented, but not yet fractured. Uh, there is a toe sleeve. They need to pump down um, you know, the perf guns. And so they have maybe like a pressure actuated toe sleeve. So they will pressure up the well that will open that toe sleeve. Now they have a single uh, entry or exit point from the well at the toe, uh, pump approximately 15 barrels of fluid over a few minutes, and then shut in for a week. And that injection, that five minute injection, will create a relatively small hydraulic fracture. And then as you shut in, that fracture is closing, and you can monitor pressure over time to estimate pore pressure, permeability, and stress. So what we're looking at here is a plot. The blue line is bottom hole pressure. So this is a plot of pressure versus G time, which is like square root of shut-in time. So it's pressure versus time during the shut-in. And these red lines are different types of derivatives that are used. So the method that I'm going to describe today, the ERTEC 2019-123 method, is going to rely primarily on using the derivative of pressure with respect to this G time. And the ideal and most common shape for that curve is an S. 
So what we're looking at here is a nice clean S shape where the derivative is very high at the beginning. It's going to go down. It's going to go back up and it's going to go back down. Um, and so the the compliance method stress estimate that I'm going to describe today, the way we, we interpret this test is I'll just step you through it. So at the very beginning, we have about 11,500 PSI of bottom hole pressure. Within 15 minutes, it's already gone down to 8,400. So what caused that enormous drop in pressure? That is near well bore tortuosity. So you have a horizontal well. The fracture wants to be transverse to the orientation of the well. And so when it initiates, it doesn't initiate immediately perfectly transverse. It's going to create a little longitudinal crack, and then cracks have a hard time rotating 90 degrees and through through solid rock. And so there's going to be this kind of complicated pinch off type region in the near well bore within maybe five, 10 feet. And then there's a far field fracture. And so the large amount of pressure required to get the fluid from the well out into that 10 feet away far field fracture is this 3000 PSI that is happening here. When you shut in, those tortuous pathways close off quickly, but they are not completely impermeable. So you still have a hydraulic connection between the well and the far field fracture. Um, and you no longer need 3000 PSI of pressure to hold open that tortuous pathway because the flow rate is very low because you've shut in. So, oh, I don't know how that happened. Let's go back here. So that's why pressure starts high and very rapidly drops off. And that's the early time um, high derivative. The next thing that happens, you're going to have approximately straight line between pressure and G time. And that's kind of the ideal scenario. So if you go back and read Ken Nolte's papers from the 1970s, he derived that a plot of pressure versus G time should make a straight line. That slope is related to the leak off coefficient and um, to things like the fracture geometry. And so this is what I think you might term the ideal Nolte period when you have an approximately straight line on the plot. But then if you go back to Nolte's papers, 1987 or so, you can say he says um, when that straight line deviates from linearity, that's when the fracture is closing. And the reason it's closing at that point in time is because the fracture closure that can affect the stiffness of the system because uh, the walls can no longer you know, freely open and close. It can affect the conductivity of the fracture because now it's you know, the walls are in contact. Um, and so that deviation from linearity uh, is supposed to indicate closure. Um, and in fact, what, I'm calling this the compliance method, but what this really is, the compliance method is the method that Ken Nolte used in 1987 and that really has been widely used in the oil and gas industry uh, since at least the 1980s. So the compliance method is in fact not new. Um, it's, it's the old way. <laughs> um, so derivative goes up when the fractures, uh, the walls contact. Um, and then what happens in the long term is um, the, the leak off rate is dropping. So as the fluid pressure gets close to the pore pressure, the leak off rate is going to go to zero. That causes this derivative to fall down to zero. So we really have high initial near world tortuosity. We have kind of an ideal Nolte period. We have closure. Uh, and a stiffening of the system as the walls contact, and then we have a reduction in leak off rate that causes the derivative to fall back, and that all creates an S shape. So that's not the method that I read in the literature a decade ago when I started working on this topic. Uh, instead, I saw what we call the tangent method. So the tangent method here, um, instead of plotting the derivative, we're plotting the derivative multiplied by G. And so um, it's it's kind of confusing, but it's this same curve, but just steeper. Um, and and the way that this tangent method works is you draw a line from the origin here up to the tangent point to this G times DP DG curve. That's taken as the time of closure, and you can come down here and uh, identify the pressure at that point, and that's what they call the tangent stress estimate. So in this case, there's about a 400 PSI difference. So what I'm going to describe today is why we believe that this tangent method is, is not accurate, and it is a systematic underestimate of the true magnitude of the minimum principal stress. But again, the first, the first reason is because when we started running simulations, um, the tangent method was, was not accurate. Uh, and that was, that was the beginning. You, know, you can't take the simulation literature, uh, literally, but you know, when a simulation tells you something like that, you need to, you need to pay attention. So again, I really want to emphasize that even though the tangent method seems like that's a widespread method, it is in fact a total departure from how stress was estimated prior to the tangent method. <laughs> so what I'm presenting, the compliance method, is how people did stress estimation in the 1980s, 
1990s and the 2000s until around the late 2000s uh, when this alternative procedure became popularized. Uh, I think this procedure may have been used a little bit earlier, but it doesn't look to me like it was widespread until the end of the decade. Um, yeah, let's see what else I'm going to say about that. I'll also note that if you leave the field of petroleum engineering, the tangent method is largely unknown. Uh, so I actually just had a paper um, that I co-authored with some some um, researchers at, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and others where we they used actually they have a an in situ uh, strain gauge uh, that can measure fracture opening and closure and we submitted it to the International Journal of Rock Mechanics and Mining Sciences. Uh, it's um, this paper right here. And and when we explained you know, hey, we, we think this tangent method is not accurate and we're demonstrating that with this data. Um, and one of the strongest reviewer comments from the reviewers at International Journal of Rock Mechanics and Mining Sciences is, well, this tangent method looks crazy. <laughs> we think, of course, no one should do that. Uh, and we had to come back and say, no, 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 really, you know, people really do this. <laughs> because if you're a civil engineer or uh, you're in mining, uh, you know, the tangent method looks looks wrong. And I, I would say if you were in petroleum engineering in the 1990s, the tangent method would look wrong. So I just want to give that context that I'm I'm not actually saying anything that's really out of the box. I'm saying something that's actually in the box um, and the compliance method is, is in the box. All right. So we wrote that paper. Uh, we did that work at UT, published a paper in SBE Journal. Uh, but that was really just kind of the the first draft of that procedure. You know, we we laid out some physics and some theory. We described, you know, why we thought this method was not accurate, what the compliance method was. But we also, you know, realized that we needed to turn this into a, an actual procedure. So in 2018, I led a consortium with Hess, Conoco, Phillips, Shell, Apache, Range Resources, Clean, Equinor, um, and, you know. All of those people contributed, or all those companies contributed experts. So, you know, Craig Sapola with Hess, Dave Kramer with ConocoPhillips, Alexi Savitsky with Shell, uh, Mojtaba Shari with, with Apache, and on and on. Um, and we put together this step by step procedure um, for interpreting a defect. And, and not just stress, but also permeability, because actually we realized that when we looked back at some of the work that was being done in con conjunction with this tangent stress estimate, that also there was some, some permeability estimation uh, techniques that looked uh, suspect. And so we um, derived some equations and, and put together a procedure. Um, and so that, that procedure is based on, number one, running numerical simulations that are full physics and matching in the field data. Now, number two, deriving equations that can accurately represent what we see in the data and in these simulations um, and taking those analytic derivations, turning them into equations that we can use practically. So even though you know I'm running a frac simulation company, uh, this ERTEC 2019-123 procedure does not require a simulator. It's designed so that anybody could do it. And in fact, I have an Excel spreadsheet that I'm happy to share with anybody where we have gone through the whole workflow in detail um, and um, you know you can you can do it for yourself. Um, Whitson is is currently making a, a new tool, uh, Matthias tells me, uh, for DFID interpretation. They're going to have this procedure in that tool. So I recommend you guys check that out. Um, uh, we need more tools that, that, that implement this method. Um, you know, for years, we in ResFrac have just done DFID interpretations for a lot of clients. We use a Python script that's not very user friendly, so we don't want to share it with people. Um, but, you know, really, that's that's not what we want to be doing. We don't want to be, you know, banging out little different interpretations for clients, we, we really want you guys to be able to do it on your own. Um, also, I would note that I have, uh, speaking of, of companies that I really like, in addition to Whitson, um, I do have a course on different interpretation with Saga Wisdom, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with. They're an online training course uh, platform, so check them out as well. Um, that is that course. So we developed that procedure, and then there's two other references that I want to mention. The the next, which is actually the title of this talk, uh, this paper I wrote and presented last year, uh, Best Practices of Defense Interpretation, Comparative Analysis of 62 Defense from Nine Different Shale Plays. So I'll go through the results from that paper today. What we did is we, we went to a lot of the companies that we had done defense interpretations for, and including the ones in the industry consortium, and said, would you let us uh, anonymize and summarize your results statistically? So I'm going to show statistical review of, of kind of some of the trends we see in these defects. So that's what I'll cover today. Uh, and the last reference, I actually put it out this month. 
you know, because Whitson's making this DFIT tool, and also actually uh, Kappa Sapphire in their release this month has this procedure in, in Kappa Sapphire. Uh, so I thought, you know, I want to make sure that people, uh, you know, I communicate out some of the kind of lessons learned and experience that that we have from having done a lot of these over the years. So this uh, this blog post here, Practical Guidelines for DFIT Interpretation Using the Compliance Method Procedure, I just... First of all, I give maybe a little bit shorter version of the interpretation procedure. If you go to the Urtech paper, some of the things that are in there in that Urtech paper, we don't actually use it every time. So this is really what I would consider to be the core interpretation procedure right here uh, in this blog post. And then I go through some practical issues, you know, things I've seen tripping me up and tripping up other people in ResFrac when we do these uh, interpretations for people. So importing data, you know, how to make the plots, and then going through you know, different non-ideality. So I, I said that, you know, this S shape, that's the ideal shape for a DFID. But but what if it's not quite an S or what if it looks like this? You know, so how would how do you want to handle things? And in some cases, you have to say that we can't estimate stress or we can't estimate permeability or pore pressure. It just depends on what we're looking at and seeing in the data. Uh, and that also applies to the to the late time post closure responses as well. Um, so ultimately, there are um, four different ways to interpret stress or or kind of the four different things you should do with respect to the stress interpretation based on what you see in the data. And there are six different things you might see in the post-closure interpretation. So if you put that together, there are 24 different combinations of situations <laughs> that you could encounter, and I've just put them all into a table here. So I know that might seem a little daunting. I, I don't think it's quite as daunting as it might seem. You really just look for how to pick stress, how to interpret post-closure, and then those tell you what to do. Um, but I wanted to just put that all together. So check this out. Um, if you're interested in doing DFID interpretation with this procedure, uh, this I think is really um, you know, helpful from a practical perspective. All right, so I said I wasn't gonna run out of time here and I haven't made any progress at all. So let me jump in um, and I'll try to be efficient with my time. So first, how do we know that the tangent method is inaccurate? Number one, the math predicted. Numerical simulations predict it. Um, analytical derivations predicted. Now, you might say, well, you know, in 2009, they were running numerical simulations and they derived the tangent method. Um, older school um, frac simulation tools have a very unrealistic way of handling fracture closure. And they it, largely what they typically assume is that when fracture walls come into contact, fracture walls, you know, the fracture disappears. It doesn't, doesn't do anything anymore. But in reality, you know, fracture walls are rough. And so when the crack walls touch, there's still fluid in the crack. It still has conductivity and fluid is still leaking off from it. And if you make that set of interpret assumptions, which is consistent with what we see in shale, at least, um, you know, you can't run a mathematical solution that derives the tangent method. Um, I think that uh, in conventional formations with high permeability, um, largely speaking, the tangent method is similar to other methods. <laughs> so it doesn't necessarily always make a difference, but it's really in shale where we see big problems. So that's the math side of it. Then how about the data? Well, in recent years, there's been now a series of papers where people have taken actual physical strain gauges, put them in the ground, and watched fractures open and close. Um, and you can compare that with an extended shut-in and say, okay, well, you know, the strain gauge, there's no more real way to know what the closure stress is than that. I, I, I think as far as science is concerned, um, you know, physically measuring the deformation of rock is the best way to know when a fracture closed. I don't think there's any other better way. Um, and so if we run those sorts of experiments, we can derive curves that look like this, which is uh, displacement versus pressure. And we can see unequivocally without any question, what is the magnitude of SH min? Um, and in this test here, it's, it's for example, 21 megapascals. Um, we can then compare that with the shut-in transients. So for example, uh, these are two sets of shut-in transients shown by this data. And if we look here in the figure in the top right, um, what we can see is that pressure has fallen off to about 15 megapascals, and the G times the PDG curve is still going up, which means that the, the test should have been performed for longer, but we know that if the tangent method had been used on this data, that it would have landed on some number less than 15 megapascals, even though we have a strain gauge here showing that the fracture is closed prior to that point in time. 
So that's just one example of several papers that have been written in recent years, and they have all found that the tangent method is systematically inaccurate. Um, also, in this Kai and Broker paper, Kai Broker paper, they're they're noting that um, the the stress estimate is so low that it violates theoretical limits on the strength of the crust, right? So there's there's uh, Mark Zoback has this critical stress theory. Uh, that has been developed to show that really all of the stress states in the subsurface, they, they can't go outside certain bounds because if they were, then the rock itself would collapse. And um, if you use the tangent method, you'll often find situations that violate those, those constraints. Um, okay, so what are the implications? Um, first off, in overpressured formations, the tangent method is often not that inaccurate. Um, when pore pressure is more normally pressured or under pressure, the tangent method can become extremely inaccurate. Um, I've encountered this several times recently with companies that are required by regulators to inject below the minimum principal stress. And they are um, in a situation where you're injecting like for CO2 sequestration or a water disposal well, or maybe even a water flood, um, you're often not in an overpressured formation at all. You might even be in an underpressured formation. So those are situations where companies can derive severe underestimates. Um, I just looked at data the other day, and there was a 2,000 psi underestimate from the application of the tangent method, and that was going to really cripple a project because they were so severely limited on their injection pressure, and it was simply because they were using this kind of you know disproven method for estimating stress. Um, it also affects frac modeling because you know one part of frac modeling is the net pressure, and if SH min is too low. Um, you can end up with unrealistic net pressures. Um, you know, if you're running a frac model, uh, the net pressure of an entire stage with 10 fracs all stress shattering each other could be 1,000 psi. That's fair. But if you have one crack, one crack will not create a net pressure of 1,000 psi. You know, unless you're an unconsolidated sandstone. And if you think it is, and 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 maybe if you're pumping cross link gel, but if you're pumping a slick water and you're running a frac simulation with 1,000 psi of net pressure per fracture. Um, you, you probably are missing something about stress or in your lower tortuosity. Um, another thing is, uh, you know, what I've what I found frustrating is that, you know, the math is saying a certain thing. So if if we reject the idea that the math is right, then we can't advance in the field. And so I've I've, I've encountered this in in discussions. Um, you know, I say, well, we we did a math solution. This is what it showed. Oh, but that math solution is wrong because the tangent method's right. And I've I've had these kind of circular arguments. So if, if we reject the math and we reject that theory predicts a thing, but we're going to reject the theory, you know, we don't have any theory. And we really, you know, as petroleum engineers don't know anything. <laughs> uh, so what I found is it kind of creates what I'd consider an intellectual cul-de-sac. Um, and, and we're held back in the field because there's this thing that we believe uh, and it, it it defies proof or reason. <laughs> so that's that's another, I think, more fundamental issue I, I see with kind of um, kind of a dogmatic uh, st uh, sticking to an older method of doing an interpretation. Um, finally, um, there's also permeability procedures. Uh, so this Barry et al. paper has an equation for permeability from time to closure. I'm going to show here in a minute. It's usually about 100 times too high. Um, and so what we're showing here in the bottom right, this is a paper I wrote with Craig Sapola and Garrett Fowler. We took a, a Utica case study and we used a permeability that was 100 times too high, which was derived from an incorrect DFID interpretation. And you can actually history match the data with that wrong perm. Um, and you can history match the data with the right perm. Because as you guys know from Witson RTA, there's a non-uniqueness between area and square root of permeability when you have linear flow and shale. Um, we actually took that history match out for a couple decades. And even at two decades, the EUR predictions from the models were pretty similar. So it, it seems truly non-unique. But the difference is that if you use the, the really wrong perm that's way too high, your effective fracture length is too short. So if you're in shale and your effective fracture length is 30 feet, your perm is wrong. Um, and believe it or not, you can go out and find papers in the SPE literature, even published in SPE journals, where people have 30 foot, 10 foot effective frac lengths for shale wells. And, and I think you guys all know from well to well interference and a lot of other data that the effective frac length in shale is not 10, 20 or 30 feet. It's hundreds of feet. Um, and so if you but if you go in with a model with that assumption, you're going to totally mess up your well spacing and you're going to mess up your, your cluster spacing and your frac design. So um, permeability actually is a really critical part of this as well. All right. So now we let, let me jump in a little bit to the actual comparison of 62 defits. 
Um, first thing I said is, well, you know, how often can we use this compliance method for estimating stress? So here's a clear contact with an S shape. Here's what I'd call an adequate contact with kind of a weak S shape. And up here in the top right, we really cannot estimate stress because DPDG is going continuously down and we're really looking for an upward deflection. Yes, there's a tiny little notch right there in the data. And uh, to me, that's not enough. So I would say that we cannot estimate the stress from this test period. Um, and how often do those scenarios occur? So in the 61 defits that I had from that case study, um, what we see is that in about 59% of them, we had what I deemed a clear contact. And another big chunk of them, we had what I would deem an adequate contact that looks like this. And in about 18%, um, we had what I would deem to be this cannot estimate stress. Um, I would say probably since this paper was written about 18 months ago, I think that this is maybe a little over optimistic. There's probably a little more than 18% that truly have this mon this monotonic response. Uh, maybe it's more like 25%. Um, so, so what's causing that? Um, well, one problem is near well bore tortuosity. So as we've noted, we have this really large and rapid pressure drop at the beginning of the defit. And so one possibility is that that is basically kind of overwhelming the transient and we're just never seeing what's happening further out in the well. Another issue is what I call rapid closure. So rapid closure is what happens under two, especially two conditions. Number one, if, if you're in a conventional reservoir, if you run a defit or a mini frac test or a micro frac, whatever you want to call it, in a, in, a, in a formation that has a permeability of 100 millidarcies, 10 millidarcies, 1 millidarcies, probably even 0.1 millidarcies, the fracture is going to close within 30 seconds of shut-in. Um, and when that happens, there's just not enough time to develop the transient that creates this up, down, up uh, thing. And it also relates to the dimensionless fractional conductivity. And, and so you'll, you will, in fact, end up with a monotonic DPDG. And in fact, the simulations will show that. So if we run a defit simulation with ResFrac in either very low injection volumes or uh, very high perm or you know, millidarcy perm, uh, you will get a monotonic DPDG. Um, and so in that case, Near well bore tortuosity is a big risk because if you have near well bore tortuosity that takes 10 minutes to dissipate and you have closure that occurs in 60 seconds, that means that it's closed while you still have near well bore tortuosity. And that's why we say we can't estimate the SH min it's because it's ambiguous. When I'm looking at this test right here, it's possible that the fracture closed at 4,300 PSI and this is just an ordinary rapid closure defect. That's possible. But this is a test that's performed in a horizontal well. And in horizontal wells, we see a lot of responses with big near well bore tortuosity. So it's also possible that the fracture closed at some other pressure. Maybe the fracture closed early, but we can't know what was the pressure in that fracture because we have this tortuous midfield region between us and the fracture. So that's why we can't estimate SH min. Now, the exception is, what if you're in a vertical well? If you're in a vertical well, and, and particularly when people use these little micro frac, uh, you know, wireline tools, inject a really small volume of rock to make a little micro frac um, in a vertical well. Well, you're not going to have near well bore tortuosity if you create a longitudinal crack along a vertical well. And so in that situation, yeah, just go ahead and pick rapid closure. And you can just make a plot of pressure versus G time and just take roughly the deviation from linearity, and that's going to give you a pretty good estimate for stress. Uh, so that, in fact, if you go back and you know look at a Mark Zoback geomechanics a book on how to estimate stress. That's what he tells you to do. You know, I think that that advice is still correct. Um, but we just have to be careful that this monotonic, you know, kind of deviation from linearity, it really is only valid if the fracture is closing rapidly. Um, and we can only use it if we don't think there's near well bore tortuosity, which probably means it needs to be a vertical well or some other special situation. So that's what's happening there. But as I said, here's the review. So most of the time, you should be able to get a stress estimate. And yes, if we look at this adequate contact signal here, um, you know, this is not a super clean S shape, probably because the near well bore tortuosity is kind of covering up, you know, some of the, the character of this transient. But we would consider this to be enough. Um, also, we can extrapolate um, the blue line back to the y-intercept here uh, through that linear portion. That's an estimate for what was the pore pressure in the fracture at shut-in. So we don't know, we can't measure the fracture in 
the pressure in the fracture is shedding because of the near world war tortuosity, but we can extrapolate back. And the difference between this pressure and this pressure is the net pressure. And generally speaking, if your net pressure estimate is larger than 500 PSI in a defit, um, you should be cautious and, and take a second look. I'm not saying it never happens. I'm even going to show you compliance method interpretations that have gone a little higher. But, you know, fracture mechanics tells us, uh, laboratory experiments tell us that net pressure should not be that high. And in fact, that's what I, I see in the data. All right. So next up, how about that near world war tortuosity? So um, here we actually just have a histogram of what is the magnitude of the near world war tortuosity. And that's measured as basically what is the pressure in the well at shut in minus the effective ISIP, the effective ISIP being this higher y-intercept value. So the difference between here and here, that would be the magnitude of the near world war tortuosity. What we can see is in these defects, only 12% had 750 or less. So this is the norm. We had tests up to five, six, seven thousand 7,000 PSI. Uh, those were mostly in the Montagne, actually. I think that's because it's a, a strike slip faulting regime. Um, but you should just expect really, really large near well more tortuosity and defits. Um, now, when you pump a full frac job, that'll be lower. It's going to be lower because the larger volume and the propent will scour out that complex region and it's going to reduce the near over tortuosity. But you should keep in mind, even when you do a full frac job, um, you know, just in shale, uh, you probably still have decent near world tortuosity. And that is really important to consider when we're looking at ISIPs, um, not just in defits, but in full frac jobs as well. Um, all right, the next thing I think that's really important is here are two defits from vertical wells. So in a vertical well, there should not be near world war tortuosity because the crack forms longitudinally. It doesn't need to create a tortuous pathway. And wouldn't you know it, but there isn't near world war tortuosity. So there's maybe one, 200 PSI of pressure drop here at the start. So that's maybe that's you know, a variety of possible things. Maybe that is a little bit of near world war pressure drop, but one or 200 PSI, the character of these transients here really looks nothing like what we're seeing in a test like this, uh, and it's really not of the magnitude at all. So the fact that this is just an ab absolutely night and day difference between defits and horizontal wells and vertical wells, I think is pretty much an unequivocal proof. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that that these early time pressure drops are near World War tortuosity. And so just to be clear, the net pressure of this test, it is not you know 3,000 PSI, 2,000 PSI. It is the difference between you know, basically SH min and the effective uh, effective ISIP. This is a defit that has a couple hundred PSI of net pressure. All right. So now let's actually just ask, well, how much difference does it really make? Uh, you know, if, if I run a compliance method stress estimate on these defits, a tangent method stress estimate on these defits, what's the difference? So here is actually the difference um, on the, let's see, Oh, okay, so this is a comparison of the net pressure. So this is the tangent methods estimate for net pressure, and this is the compliance methods estimate for net pressure. Um, if they were the same, they would be falling along the red line. Um, and what we're showing is that actually the, the net pressure estimate coming from the compliance method, that is the effective ISIP minus SH min, is on average 2.5x. So it's, it's more than double. Um, and so we can see the compliance method here uh, we have a lot of numbers from 100 to 200. We have a good number from 200 to 400 coming from the compliance method. We have a few coming up to 500, and there is one test in this catalog where the compliance method was above 500. Um, and I, I wonder if that was a real point or not, or if something went wrong. Conversely, tangent method is routinely going above 500, in fact, mostly going above 500, um, and coming up as high as, as 1400 in this catalog. Um, so that's the difference. Um, now, sometimes it doesn't make a big difference. And, and here's how overpressure affects it. So on the, the X axis here, this is the compliance method stress estimate minus pore pressure. Um, and so what we can see is, is we're to the left, we're in a more overpressured formation. And the more overpressured we are, that is the closer pore pressure gets to SHM in, the Y axis is the difference between the methods. It's the compliance method stress minus the tangent method stress, and the difference is, is getting as low as, as 100 or 200 PSI. And at that point, you're almost, you know, it's almost the same thing. And, and I, I actually, not in this catalog, but I, I do know of defense where they're giving the same answer. 
Um, oh, and I should note, just sorry for completeness, after we pick the contact pressure with the compliance method, we subtract 75 PSI. That's part of the method. So I really haven't given a full outline of the details of the method. I'd, I'd refer you to other references for time. But anyway, that's the point. So again, if you're in an, in, in an overpressured formation, if you're in the Haynesville, uh, you know, you, you might not see a big difference. Um, if you're in a more normally pressured situation, like maybe the Midland Basin, you're probably going to see a bigger difference. And if you're in some CO2 sequestration project, uh, and maybe you've got an under-pressured formation that you've selected because you think it's going to be easy to inject into, you could see a really big difference. And this is predicted by theory. Essentially, the reason why this G times the PDG curve peaks and goes back down is because you have deviation from Carter leak off. Uh, and as the pore pressure, uh, as the frac pressure gets close to the pore pressure, the leak off rate goes to zero. So really what we're seeing here is kind of a slowing of the leak off rate. And so the peak of the G times the PDG curve is actually controlled by the pore pressure. So the tangent method stress estimate is really kind of picking a point that's related to the pore pressure. Um, and that's why if the pore pressure is lower and lower, then it's pulling down the tangent method um, prediction. All right, you know, a couple more quick points. Um, on the topic of permeability estimation, another really interesting finding is something called false radial. Uh, and I actually saw this in simulations before I had ever interpreted a gas shield defit. Uh, so ResFrac is a multi-phase flow reservoir simulator and a frac simulator. And so I believe that ResFrac is probably the first code to have ever run a defit simulation with a full physics closure and a full physics uh, multi-phase flow leak-off calculation. And when we did that, the first thing we saw in the simulations was if you make this log-log plot here, uh, that's the, the pressure derivative plot, that once it peaks, it goes straight into a minus one slope. And a minus one slope is supposed to be radial flow. But that radial flow is too early. Um, here's an example of, of real radial flow. So this is what I think is actually radial flow in a defit. You should get a linear flow period first, and then later a radial flow period. And it should take a long time for radial flow. So actually this defit here, this was a fairly high permeability for a shale play. It had a very low injection volume. It had like eight barrels of injection and they shut in for three or four weeks. I think it's three weeks. Um, and that those combination of situation allowed them to see real radial flow. But if, if you didn't pump eight barrels and it's not, you know, micro Darcy's and you didn't wait three weeks, you probably didn't get radial flow. And if you see something like this, it's, it's probably false radial. And so you can predict that from running simulations. It's a multi-phase flow effect related to the interaction of basically the filtrate zone to the reservoir region um, as the fracture is closing. Um, this is an unusual example where we actually see fault radial and then true linear after that. Uh, but usually what would happen is the test ends um, during fault radial. You know, if you shut it in for three months, you would always see fault radial go into linear, but often you'll just see only fault radial. So you cannot use this fault radial to estimate permeability, even though it'll be tempting. Um, so this is showing that in the gas tests we ran, the great majority of them showed fault radial. Uh, and in the oil tests we we, sh we ran, only one of them showed false radial. I would note um, there was a paper that uh, was written last year. I'm blanking on the gentleman's name who wrote it, but he looked at volatile oil reservoirs that have really high GOR, and he actually saw a lot of probably false radial. So I would say not just gas, but also a very volatile oil. And really, actually, what matters is the viscosity. So you need to have the the injection fluid needs to have. Uh, a higher viscosity than the reservoir fluid. And under those conditions, you can see false radial. Um, all right. Um, if we compare false radial with the permeability estimation procedure that, that we recommend in the ERTEC procedure, this is a histogram of the difference. Uh, you can see this is 1 to 20. So essentially, the most common is about 60 to 80x difference. So the false radial will give you a very inaccurate and large overestimate of the permeability. So watch out, don't use false radial to estimate permeability. Um, if you check out the ERTEC procedure, we go through a few different options for estimating permeability. They typically give pretty similar answers. Um, and the, which one you select kind of depends on, on the quality of the data or what's happening in the test. I'll skip that for time. Finally, I'll mention this holistic permeability procedure. So this is from that Bari et al. 2009 paper. Uh, this equation here, it looks awfully strange. It's it's predicting permeability from time to closure as estimated from the tangent method. 
Um, and I, I don't think there's any analytic derivative that would, uh, I think it's uncommon to take the, the, this is the natural log of the difference between closure pressure and pore pressure to the fifth power to the 1.8th power. So if you just look at that equation, you know, you might be suspicious something is, is fishy. <laughs> uh, and indeed it is if we compare this equation with more accurate permeability estimation methods that we've taken from the compliance method. Uh, here's a histogram of the difference on a log scale. So on average, uh, the most common is it's going to be from 30 to 100 X too high, but we have cases where it's hundreds or even a thousand X too high. So this equation is extremely inaccurate uh, and do not use it and then put it into your Whitson RTA because it will really confuse things. Um, but you know, it's important to, to note that that's out there and be aware of that. All right, so again, I'll refer you guys back first to that blog post that I that I posted uh, earlier this month. It has, you know, what I think is kind of the simple and streamlined practical procedure, what we really use. Uh, and then if you want to understand the theory and more of the basis, uh, you know, you can refer to some of these references here, the Ertec paper, uh, even this earlier paper that, that we wrote at UT. And then if you want to see some of these um, papers like where they're, they're testing, um, measuring closure with mechanical devices, these are the references um, as well. All right, and um, I will stop there so that we have some time for questions. And I'll just mention, you know, what I'm presenting today is, uh, you know, probably about 10 years of, of work over over multiple projects. And so, you know, starting with with my collaborators uh, at UT as well, Dave Kramer from ConocoPhillips. Um, and then he was also part of the Stephen Industry Consortium um, with, with, you know, folks like Craig Sapola, Lucas Martin, Lexi Savitsky. Um, and then also, you know, our more recent work, Chris Ponners, Hans Rondon, Dave Radcliffe, Garrett, Osama, Ankush, and Rohan. Uh, you know, these are our, our folks in ResFrac that do work for, for on behalf of clients, and they've done a lot of the defit interpretations uh, that went into that statistical review. Uh, finally, the statistical review used data from a variety of operators who gave us permission to anonymize and include in that study. Appreciate that. And also some of the work on directly measuring closure with mechanical devices was led by Eve Guglielmi. Um, he actually didn't do a project to test closure techniques. He just has this cool device that measures fracture closure. And I said, hey, why don't we use it for testing closure techniques? They said, sure. Uh, so uh, that was part of the EGS uh, CoLab project led by Tim Kanifsi. Okay, so I will pause and take uh, questions. Awesome, Mark. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll have to be a little bit selective. I see some of you guys have written some private questions to myself and stuff. Uh, I'll try to prioritize the ones that have been submitted through the Q&A. Uh, and uh, I think David actually kicked it off with a really, at least a question that I think is really um, uh, interesting is, is uh, David Gurney from Chesapeake. Uh, why did the tangent method become popular in the first place? It doesn't seem to be easier <laughs> to implement or computate here. Was there some deficiency in the compliance method uh, that they were trying to overcome? Question mark. It's a good question. Uh, you know, I am only uh, 37, so perhaps I um, don't know all the historical details. Um, I would say that um, I think that if you go back to papers in the 90s, the the tangent method is based in some things that are right and make sense. But when you got into shale, it got misapplied and it wasn't recognized. So in other words, some of the tangent, like the tangent method if applied to a defit in a conventional reservoir under certain circumstances um, is probably doing OK. Uh, but then the the physics of the transient when you have low permeability is very different because when the fracture walls contact, um, the fracture remains infinite conductivity versus in conventional formations, higher perm, when the fracture walls contact, the fracture is not uh, infinite conductivity. And so that actually, that completely changes the, the character of how the transient behaves. I think that key point was missed. And so they took methods that applied in one context, applied them in a different context where they didn't yield a correct answer, uh, and that was missed. So I think that's point one. And then I think point two is, is frankly, my, my experience working in this field is um, if you're teaching a lot of courses, giving a lot of talks, and uh, writing a lot of papers, people will tend to just think you, you're probably right about something. And that's what happened is there was a lot of effort to promote the idea, and so then it was accepted. <laughs> that and also I think if, if something gets embedded in software tools, then that becomes a de facto standard. Um, and it, there, you know, I, I think it was just sort of um, 
you know, uh, I don't know, you need a PhD in human psychology to fully explain it, but that's how I, I think what happens. <laughs> No, I, I buy that. Uh, I like it. Uh, so we also have a question here from uh, Verdugo. Uh, if the fracture grows out of the main target into a layer with different properties, stress, leak of, et cetera, is the compliance method still better compared to the uh, tangent method? Well, first off, I mean, the tangent method just doesn't have any basis and I wouldn't use it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think so. So the conventional interpretation of this belly up signature, there's two. One of them, the tangent method interpretation of the belly up signature. One is closure of transverse fractures. Uh, and I actually think that's just a completely wrong interpretation. I, I don't think you should ever use closure of transverse fractures. Um, but um, we did actually, I, I wrote a paper when I was at UT, and this was Ho Jung Jung's paper, um, where we actually did explicitly simulate you know, these alternative explanations, um, including closure of transverse fractures, which doesn't look like a belly up signature. So I think that's just totally wrong. Um, but number two is this height recession uh, concept. So here's a simulation of height recession right here. Um, and first off, if they're really, first off, what I'm saying is that the net pressure is a couple hundred PSI. So if, if the net pressure is a couple hundred PSI when a fracture propagates, that means that if the stress barrier is more than a couple hundred psi, it's just not going to go into that layer. Um, you know, uh, so that's that's point one. Is if net pressure is only a couple hundred psi, then you just you can't be that wrong. Um, it is true that if you have a very thin layer, uh, that's that's lower stress. Uh, you can kind of contrive a, an unlikely situation in which you can get height confinement, and you could have a small belly up signature from from height recession. Um, so it's possible to contrive a scenario with just the right set of circumstances to get a belly up signature. And yet, sure, it's possible that you could be off by one or 200 PSI in a worst case scenario from that kind of situation. Um, you know, the problem is taking that kind of unlikely contrived scenario and just thinking that that applies to like the majority of all defects, which I think is way off. I think that you've got to start with the simple thing and the simple thing says that a belly up signature is the norm in defits and that's what the data shows <laughs> um and and so i i think that when we start to get into these kind of more hypothetical situations um you know you're talking about second order effects that are going to cause minor inaccuracy in the code and what's happened is with the holistic method or the tangent method someone's taken this kind of minor unlikely second order effect and made it the primary interpretation for most defits and then i think that's where where things went wrong Awesome. Uh, uh, two quick low ball questions. Will, uh, will you be able to share the slide deck? Uh, yeah, sure. Or is there anything kind of proprietary? Nope. Uh, perfect. And then um, uh, the second thing is related to slide number nine. There was the uh, use of wellhead pressure, WHP. Is that a typo or is that no. actual wellhead pressure? No, when I interpret defits, um, if I have wellhead pressure, I often just plot wellhead pressure and do the interpretation directly on the raw data. And then obviously when you are estimating stress or pore pressure, you just add a hydrostatic adjustment at the end. That's just my personal preference. And that way, the, that way the data that I'm plotting is the quote real data. But it's just, that's just my personal preference. Okay, excellent. Um, very good. Uh uh, we'll uh, also try to do a couple of other questions here. Um, one from Mr. Gonzalez here. In some cases, we see really high ISIPs with a clear water hammer. Mm -hmm. Good well bore frac uh, connection. But pressure still declines very rapidly. So ISIP effective is lower than the ISIP at shut in. Do you think this is due to near well bore friction, I guess? Or I don't know what the NWB stands for. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what we're showing here. So um, the. Yeah, the, the the literal ISIP is, as we're showing here, thousands of PSA higher than the effective ISIP. And I believe that that is near well bore tortuosity. And again, the reason that I think that's a very strong interpretation is when you look at vertical well defects, suddenly that goes away. It's it's a one-to-one -one predictor. Awesome. Perfect. So uh, with that, I know there's like a ton of questions. We'll not be able to go through all of them, but I'm sure Mark um, will uh, happily answer them if you contact them at marketrestpract.com. Uh, <laughs> really appreciate everybody for uh, uh, joining uh, to uh, today. Uh, Mark, excellent presentation as always. Appreciate uh, 
you're always trying to seek uh, seek out the truth, which is uh, which is great. Uh, for all the attendees, the recording will be distributed a little bit later today, so watch out for uh, for that. And uh, thanks, uh, thanks again. Yeah, thanks again, guys. And uh, yeah, always email me if you have any questions. And and yeah, it was enjoy enjoyed giving the presentation, and thanks for the invitation.